you feel like going home? Do you really feel like going home? study for tonight at verse number 26. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26 is where we are tonight. On last week, we ended our, our time together with Paul saying that he don't rejoice. Oh yeah, he don't rejoice. Amen? Why was Paul rejoicing so last week? Why was he saying in the earlier verses that I'm going to rejoice and then he says I'm going to rejoice and then he said yes I am going to rejoice. Why was Paul rejoicing in such a manner? Because the gospel of Christ was being spread. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ was being spread, right? Do we get that excited when the gospel is being spread? Do we? No. Do we get excited or we get excited about when the church raised enough money? Is that why we get excited? Or do we get excited when the gospel is being spread? Luke chapter 15 says, when one soul comes to Christ, the angels in heaven throw a block party. They get excited. They celebrate. And Paul is saying, even though he, he's locked up in prison, <coughs> he's excited about it because the gospel is going forth. Let me tell you, when you're going through your trials and your tribulation, you have to make sure that you see something worth living for even in the midst of it. Even while you're going through, there ought to be something in your life that's worth rejoicing about. Yes, sir. Does anybody in this room have anything worth rejoicing about? I know you're not going through much stuff right now. I know you, your life for you is just real good right now. I know things are not bothering you right now. But when you were going through six years ago, when you were going through ten years ago, were you able to rejoice through it? You were trying. Yes, I was. You were trying. You're being grateful even in your troubles and your trials. Paul says that even though I'm locked in a Roman prison, even though I know my death is near, 
I'm going to rejoice because the word of God is being spread. You have to have a motive on planet earth to spread the gospel of good news of Christ. And when you see the gospel of good news of Christ being spread, you need to rejoice about it. I'm not talking about a new car, new house, that stuff. That's, that, that really, that's temporal things, temporal stuff. Those things going to pass away probably before you do. How many of y'all had five cars already, two cars, three cars already? They just quit on you, your cars. <laughs> I mean, cars just quit. It doesn't matter what label they have on it. doesn't matter what emblem they have on it, whether the emblem is long, drawn out, and curved around, or whether the emblem is round with the soul peace sign in the middle of it. <laughs> if you're over 40 years old, you know what the peace sign looks like, right? Because when I grew up, they had a sign that, that said, love, soul, happiness, and joy. I don't know what children got signs of now. Music was written for, for men to, to, to uh, really, really show women how much they love them, but I don't know what music is written for, what purpose is written for now. So the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 that Paul was excited, he was ecstatic about this church at Philippi because number one, they stuck with, him, with the Lord. Number two, they stuck with him and they showed their appreciation to him by giving him money. And they were consistent with praising the Lord and consistent walking with the gospel, even though it was not a good time to walk in the gospel. What do I mean when I say it wasn't a, a good time to walk in the gospel? What, what am I talking about? People, well, be in jail. people were being persecuted and prosecuted because of the gospel, right? They were put to shame. Some of them were being killed. And here we find Paul in prison. And in, in prison, would you be writing a letter to us 2,000 years ago if you were in prison? Would you even think about folk that are going to be born 2,000 years ago? Probably not. Probably not. Why not? Would you even be thinking about your local church? You can hear Nero's chopping block. 2,000 years ago. Right outside of your, your cell. Sharpening that for Paul's neck. Would you be thinking about writing a letter? Would you be thinking about writing a letter to your church? Pray for me. That's the extent of your letter. Pray for me. What you want us to pray? So you want out. Now here Paul here says, I know that, that there are some preachers preaching that don't have the right motive. And then he says, there are some preachers that are preaching with the right motive. He says, but regardless of what motive they have, let them preach because Jesus is being spread. The gospel is being spread, right? So he comes and he says, I love the fact that there are some preachers preaching with the right motives. They got the right motive. They're preaching for the gospel to be spread. They're preaching because Jesus Christ is real in their lives, right? So we come to verses 19 through 26 tonight. Paul says that he knows that even though he's locked up, even though he's in a prison cell, even though things are not going his way, even though death is round the corner, he understands one thing real well, that this is for his deliverance. He says, your prayers and the supply of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, he says, I'm going I'm to be delivered. How faithful can you be? In times of trouble. Can you see something good happening when you got things bad in your life? I mean, some people can testify. I got up this morning, and before I could get up, things were going bad for me. As I went through the day, things were going bad for me. Paul saying, regardless of how bad things are going, he believes by faith that this is going to be to his deliverance. Is that you? Pink slip. Health challenges. Spouses walking out. Children disrespectful. Can you say it's going to be for, for the good? Yes, sir. I think if we look at the end result of what, where it all boils down to, we're going to be and where we're going to go, we can jump, we can shine. Okay. If we so, pray the Lord for that. But many times we don't know the end results. That's the problem. Well, if you know Christ and if you know what's going on, 
If you know Christ, you ought to know that the end result is going to be good somewhere. Yes, sir. Then you can find joy. Children that you birthed, children that you reared, get five years old and cuss you out. Oh, no. Can you see some good end results in that? Yeah. I can see me kissing a cake. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be good, though. I'm talking about good results. <laughs> Paul said, this is going to be for my deliverance. And he says, you all are praying. He knows that this church is really going to be praying for him. Can Matthew Alexander Davis say that this church is praying for him? Yes. Lord, change him. Is that what you're praying? No. Lord, keep him. Lord, Lord bless him. Lord, kill him. Oh, God, drop me nearer. So he said that this all is for his deliverance. And, for, and through your prayers, through the Holy Spirit, he's saying that he got expectations going on. Expectations. You ought to have some great expectations regardless of how bad things are. You ought to have great expectations. The homeless man ought to have great expectations. I think it was May 18th, 2018. Uh, they were calling people that they had called people all ever since March. The first thing they did, they got rid of the president of the country. Now, when they start from the top, yeah. there's something wrong. They started at the top. The head honcho. They got rid of the president first. And you would normally think that the president, they would at least let the president come down and fire all the people under him. But they got rid of the president first. Then they got rid of the director's next. Then they got rid of the manager's next. Then they got rid of the engineers and the, and the architects next. Not that I could see the handwriting on the wall, but when they got rid of the president, I started taking my stuff home. I know that's right. The moment, the day they got rid of the president, all the books that I brought there that belonged to me, they went to my house. All the gadgets that I had put together that belonged to me, they went to my house. My little ivy plant. I had my ivy plant. I walked out the door with my ivy plant. I didn't wait till they called me. I took my plant with me. So would you rejoin them then? Two months ahead of time. They hadn't gotten me yet. But I knew if they started at the top, water flows downhill. But the question if I was in Mississippi, they'd say it a different way, but water flows downhill. I walked out of there with my ivy plant two months ahead of time. Because I was determined to rejoice anyhow. That's right. So they started the 1st of March getting rid of people. And in the meantime, they were bringing in new people. How can you justify getting rid of the aged and the experienced people and bringing in 21, 22, 35-year-olds? I can see the handwriting on the wall. For six months, I trained him. For four months, I trained him. And now they have my jobs. They brought guys in from Mexico, brought guys in from Colombia. They brought guys in from all over the world other than the United States, put them with us, and they really, really picked our brains. Some people say, I wouldn't have told them everything. Let me tell you, when the handwriting is on the wall, when they've determined to get rid of you, they're going to get rid of you whether you train the person right or not. Might as well train them right because that'll keep you there a little longer. You got to learn how to rejoice in the midst of it. What would it look like if you say, well, I'm not training him, I'm not training her to take my job. Well, you can just take your stuff right now. At least you can buy it two more months. I said that. But you ought to rejoice. You ought to be... 
You ought to know with the, with beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has something greater for you. Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know, uh, for we know, that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. Amen. Everything works together for the good. I don't mind telling the story now, but I hated it then. Fifteen years ago when I first came to this church, I had I had participated in, I had been a part of two fires in the chemical plant and one explosion. In my first six months as the pastor was worse than both fires in the explosion. <clears throat> Brother Whitlock, you would have shut down. You would have just walked away, sir. I ain't got to deal with it. But you have to learn to rejoice in the midst of trouble. And you have to learn to rejoice in the midst of persecution. And even in the midst of prosecution, you have to learn to rejoice. Paul says, I rejoice. And then he comes back and says, yes, I rejoice. He says, because even the prison gods are being saved. And even the prisoners that hang out with me are being delivered. Because they see how I'm carrying myself, even though I'm locked up. He says, I have expectations. Verse number 20, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 20. According to my honest expectation and hope, I got hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, he's saying, I do this all the time. This ought to become a lifestyle for you. Have you ever been caught in the middle of a situation you didn't know how it's going to turn out? And it turned out all right? So you ought to be able to reflect on those things when God delivered you in the past and how he made things good for you in the past and trust him in your present and in your future. I mean, I had a good job. Making a whole lot of money. With bills to pay. And a wife to feed every two hours. But they released me. So by the time they get to me two months later, guess what happened? I walked out with my, my banana, my notebook, and my pen. Called me to the office and said, Matt, he wants to see you. I got, I got my stuff. I said, see ya. <laughs> it wasn't my first rodeo, you know. I said, see ya. They, they thought I was going to start packing up stuff. Man, I packed up stuff two months ago. I got all of my personal stuff, and I'm gone. Walked down there, he, he started in his little dialogue, wasn't very sympathetic at all. I said, okay, thank you. I appreciate the time I was here. In the back of my mind, I'm always saying, God has something greater and something better. In other words, I, like Paul, have great expectations. I, like Paul, have hope. I, like Paul, have so much hope. You see, the reason why people die early is because they lose hope. You can live without food for 40 days. Have you ever tried it? You can live without food for 40 days. You can live without water for 40 hours. You can live without air for seven minutes. But you cannot live two seconds without hope. You can live without food, you can live without water, you can live without air, but you cannot live without hope for two seconds. Mm -hmm. Only reason you're on planet Earth now, you still got some hope. Make sure while you're here, you're leaving a legacy in Jesus' name. So Paul says, I, I got hope, I got expectations, and because I'm locked up, I'm not ashamed. You know, some people get embarrassed about anything. In, in elementary school, we would sit at the table and we were eating food. Children would embarrass other children because they ate free food. 
Now, we didn't have the choices y'all have today. Children would sit at the table and they would bully and laugh at those of us in Head Start. Y'all know what Head Start is? Yeah. In Head Start, we had free food. They paid for theirs and they made fun of us. And guess what? It's the same sausage. It's the same one they bought. It's the, we eat free and they paying for the same meat. If I had known then what I know now, I would have been laughing at them. They thought they were better than us because they paid for their food. You know, everybody that, 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 that goes to school don't go to Head Start. Certain people like me go to Head Start. Y'all with me? You know, certain people with a certain income go to Head Start. Other people go to private school, they go, they go to, to, what else they go to? Daycare, they pay a lot of money. And see, Head Start program was a government program. Yes, sure and right to this day, when I go home and sometime I make a phone call, I talk to my very first Head Start teacher that I ever met. Miss Bankhead is still friends with my mama today. She's in her mid-70s, mid going toward her late 70s, and we take pictures together every time I go home. Miss Georgia Banky, my head start teacher. You, get, you better learn to rejoice. You better, you better learn to see those who made an impact in your life as making an impact in your life. You have to learn to rejoice. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. And, tell, and let me tell you something, I ain't have sense enough to be ashamed. <laughs> I didn't even know any better. You see, that's the problem with racism and prejudice. Children are not born racist. They are not born prejudiced. All you have to do is look in the classroom and on the playground. They all mix together. It's only until we learn this behavior from old trifling grown folk that we become separated. Think we are better than anybody else. And children bully children because adults bully adults. It's a learned behavior. We have to understand because we in Christ, we ought not be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Matter of fact, <laughs> I got boldness. <laughs> And he says, this boldness that I have, I've always had it. What he's saying is, when I kill Christians, when I kill people that follow Jesus, I did it with boldness. Now that I'm on, I'm on the Lord's side, I do that with boldness. How many of you have shut down since you got with the Lord? You know, you used to pop it on the dance floor. Now you can't even get up and clap your hands in church. And some of us had some smooth moves. Every now and then I have to show Sister David some of my moves. At the house, not out, out in public. I have to show her some of my moves. Every now and then I have to lay down my rap. Y'all know what rap is, right? Every now and then I have to talk trash because I haven't forgotten who I used to be. God has just blessed me to be bold in the spirit of God. He says, with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body. Your goal should, to glor should be to glorify, magnify, make big Jesus Christ in your life so other folk can see him clearly. We got to make him big. We got to blow him up. This word magnify means to expand Christ, to blow him up, to magnify him so that he can be glorified. The problem is we're not magnifying Christ. Remember, Paul is, is talking from a, de, a depressed situation 
When some people get depressed, they just can't handle it. I mean, they just fall to pieces. And then there are some people that get depressed about everything. I mean, just it doesn't matter. Somebody look at them wrong. It just shuts their whole day down. We had a guy that we didn't want to put up with at work sometime. About three of us get together and say, hey, we don't want to deal with him today. First guy, when he walks out, the first guy looks at him and says, man, you look kind of pale. About an hour later, another guy said, man, are you all right? And just walk off. Next guy said, man, you look, are you sick? By noon, we don't, we don't have to put up with him anymore. He's gone home. He, he just, he shut completely down. He gone home. He, he's gone to the doctor. He, and we just made him feel like he was sick. Some people get depressed over nothing. Some people get depressed over any little thing. People stop going to church because somebody looked at them wrong. We have a sign outside on the, on the, on the sign that says, the church hurt Jesus, but he still comes. The church, it was the church that hurt Jesus. And he keeps showing up. But with us, if somebody look at us wrong, if somebody says something, people have resigned from, from leadership position because somebody said something. People have changed churches because I don't like how they look at me. Dude told me the other day, man, I can't go to that church. They, they, they gonna laugh at my car. Well, I ain't tell you, get that old rat in the car. You thought since you thought since you was a young man, you had to have diamond in the back, sunroof top, bigger the scene with a gangster lean. Go buy you a, a 1985 car, and so you can blast your music. Then you don't want to go to church. Tell me they're gonna make fun of your car. Well, first of all, they don't even know whose car it is. Secondly, they are not concerned about your car. Thirdly, you're missing out on godliness because you're concerned about somebody else. Paul says, I am bold. He says, my purpose for life is to magnify Jesus Christ. What's your purpose? Why are you here? And if, what if this question was asked in a room full of executives? Even those who pay your, your bills. What would your answer be? I know what your answer is going to be tonight. If I went around the room and I asked every person in the room tonight, what's your purpose for playing the earth? What are y'all going to say? To glorify God. To magnify his name. To make big God. That's the right answer. But would you say that answer in any given situation? Or would you start talking about my purpose is to become the lead, lead person on the totem pole right here? How many of you all have to do or have done self-evaluations at work? That's one of the worst things you could ever do. It's bad because if you're a Christ and you've been taught all your life, don't brag on yourself. But if you don't think of anything good about yourself, you better think of something for the next two hours to put it on there. And these things are two to four hours long. Some people take it home and work on it all night long. You got to think of, of this and think of this and why you did this and not why you did that. And we've been taught all our life to be humble. Don't lift yourself. Lift Jesus. But the moment we leave these doors, we forget about magnifying Jesus. Paul says, my goal, my purpose is now to magnify Christ in my body. He said, while I'm living, i got to magnify Christ. Because when you're dead, it's over. There's no magnifying Jesus Christ when you're dead and gone. Look at what else he said. Whether, whether by life or by death, i got to magnify Christ. How many of you have gone to funerals and the preacher just standing there flat foot lying about how good a person the deceased was? And then when you pay a preacher to come in and preach, he, he doesn't even know. But they can paint a lovely picture. 
Guy died, one of the worst guys in the world that his wife has seen. Preacher was talking about how great he was and how, how humble he was and, and how he was always working at the church and what all he did for the Lord. The, the woman said, baby, go up there and see if that's your dad in that casket. <laughs> because obviously this preacher is not talking about your dad and my husband. I don't have that problem of lying. Just tell it like it is, and you won't have to worry about which lie you told next to him. That's right. Tell him why you got tested. We have to, we have to magnify Christ in our bodies while we're living. And when we're gone, our legacy magnifies him. What would you say about your pastor? <laughs> If you didn't see him anymore, what would you say? Raise your hand, talk to him. What would you say about your pastor? What's I would say my pastor was the man of God. He knew the word. Uh, he delivered the word. I'm going to give you a dollar to his old And I, that's why I came back to New Beginning. Okay, so what would you say? What would you say about him? Now, what would you want your pastor to say about you? That I was uh, a faithful pastor. Okay, what can your pastor say honestly about you? Somebody else going to talk to me? Yeah, I'm sure. I want you to say it. Well, you got to flow. Okay, my thing, my pastor <laughs> thinks to me about me. If I'm like, when I'm straight out there, it's tell the truth. Sister Darren's came to church. Served the Lord, she loved the Lord. Uh, she shared her life of the Lord with others, even if they didn't take heed. Okay. Anybody else? What can your pastor say about you? Come on. What if you had to write your own obituary tonight? What if you had two seconds to live and you had two seconds? Okay, two minutes to write your own obituary. What 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 clause would you put in there? What phrase would you say about you? What what sentence would you make about you? Give me three. Give me three sentences. Everybody in the room, give me three sentences. Think about three things other than solidarity. <laughs> three things that you that your preacher could say about you when you're dead and gone. Paul says, I'm gonna magnify him in my living and in my dying. Yes, ma'am. You can say that I'm an honest person. Can you slide over a little bit so I can see your eyes? I am an Sit honest Sit in the second chair if you would. I can say, what about you? I'm an honest person. If you ask me something, I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay, she says she's an honest person. You ask her something, she's going to tell you the truth. But what can we say if we don't ask you something? I don't spread other people's information around. She doesn't spread other people's information? Worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Who, that, who else talking? Who else going to tell me? What can your preacher say about you? What would your life say about you? I love yeah. the Lord. I love the Lord. He was a good tither. He was a good tither. <laughs> now you know you just opened the door, right? <laughs> he was a good tither. What was the last one? He was faithful. He was faithful. Okay, we got to check the computer to see if any of those are true. <laughs> He loved the Lord. He was a good tither, and he was faithful. Anybody else? Come on, share with me, even if you wouldn't intend to. Share with me. They said he's going to share with you later on. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? All right, we got three. We got three people that's going to glorify the Lord in, in their life and in their death. Verse number 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What is Paul saying? He says, for to me to live, if I live, I'm going to live for the Lord. If I stay on planet Earth, my reputation, my character will be of such that people can point out the fact that I'm living for the Lord. Can they say that you're living for the Lord? Can you say that you're living for the Lord? See, because people say things about themselves, and while they're saying it about themselves, at the moment that they're saying it, they're like, oops, that's not really true. 
says, he says, if I'm living or if I'm dead, if I'm living, I'm living in Christ. For, for me to live, in other words, I just exist if I don't live for Christ. I'm living in Christ and I'm living for Christ and, it, and I don't really have a, a life unless I live for Christ. Before Christ, we were just existing. We were just there. We're just hanging out. We're just marking time. When the military men march in place, when they march in place, they're marking time. We're just marking time. We're just marching in place when we're not saved. We're not born again. Everybody needs to be born again. To live. For me, for to me to live, King James would say it like this: For to me to live is Christ. For to me to live is Christ. New King James said, For to me to live is Christ. Then he says, and to die is gain. What are you talking about? To die is gain. When he dies, he's going to know he's going to be with the Lord. When he dies, he's going to be with the Lord. Paul says, I really got it going on. He says, he says, if, if I live, I'm going to live unto the Lord. I'm going to live in Christ. If I die, I'm going to gain more than I can ever gain on planet Earth because I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. For to me to live is Christ. So in, for me to, in order for me to live, i got to be in Christ. And since I'm living, and since I'm in Christ, I'm, I'm going to be a great testimony for others to see. Then he says, and to die is gain. I'm going to get all these things that God has been storing up for me. The modern day prophet Steve Harvey tells a story about a man going to heaven. You know, he can get so holy sometimes. He can, he can get so holy. One, one, night, one, night, one night he was going all alone, and so they was like, who, who is that, Tyler Perry? <laughs> no, that's Steve Harvey at it again. He can get, he can get sanctimonious sometimes. So in the, in the modern-day prophet term, Steve Harvey, he says a man died and went to heaven. And when he was walking through with St. Peter, there were some rooms that St. Peter didn't show him. And he said, hey, look, what's in that room? He said, Don't, no, never mind, that, that's not for you. He goes to another room, he said, well, that's not for you. He said, well, I want to see what's in this room. That room got my name on it. Let me see what's in this room. And there are presents and boxes and blessings stacked up to the ceiling, wall to wall. And so the angel says to him, these are all the blessings that God had in store for you. But you didn't pray for them and you didn't live for them. So now they're still here and you will never get them. Is that you? Is that, is that, is that what God is, is that what God has in store for you to show you what you missed out on? Or are you going to live for Christ? And when you die, you're going to get everything that God has for you. Verse 22. But if, but if I live on in the flesh. Now, this word flesh is not talking about in your sinful flesh. He's talking about if I live on in this body. If I continue to live in this body. If I continue to labor in this body. If I continue to live in this flesh. It will, it will mean that I have the fruit of my labor. In other words, this will mean the fruit from my labor will be presented to me. In other words, I'm going to be blessed if I live. If I live in this body. Now this is a man talking from prison. This is a man that's on death row. This is a man that doesn't have long to live. He knows he's going to be killed. And he's talking like this. He says, if I, if I live in this body, in this flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Then he says, yet what I should choose, I cannot tell. Listen to Paul talking like he's going to be able to choose life or death. He says, if I choose, what I choose, I cannot tell. He says, verse number 23, he says, for I am hard pressed between the two. He said, I'm, I'm confused now. I'm really, 
I'm really so hard pressed between the two is that I don't know what choice to make. What he's really saying is, I don't know which is better for me. I don't know which, be which is better for me because if I live, I'm going to live unto the Lord. If I die, I'm going to have gain. I'm going to gain whatever God has in store for me. I am hard pressed between the two. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ. How many of you got a desire to be with the Lord? Do you know that some people will not? You have a desire to be with the Lord? Your, your desire, your desire. What's your desire? I'm not talking about when. I didn't ask you your timetable. <laughs> because for most people, their timetable would never be one that they're ready to leave. I'm just asking you what your desire is. What's your desire? To be with the Lord? You know the story. School teacher asked some elementary school boys, how many of y'all going to want to go to hell? Out of 23 students, 22 raised their hand. We always give them the name Little Johnny. So Little Johnny, Little Johnny, why didn't you raise your hand? He said, I thought you had a busload taken off right now. I ain't ready to go yet. <laughs> Johnny said, I thought you, I thought one of those buses pulling up out there, I thought they were going to take us now. I want to go to heaven, I just don't want to go now. <laughs> Paul says, well, I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is the better for me. He says, I know it would be better for me if I just leave this old world. When we look at the, the situations that's going on around us now, somebody has said, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready to get out of here. Lord, come on now. I'm ready to get out of here. Because of the troubles of this world. People are saying, I don't even want to bring any children into this world if they got to face this. People are saying, Lord, come on, come on now. So my desire is to part, depart to be with Christ because I know that's what's better for me. Verse 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needed, needful to you, for you. Nevertheless, if I remain in the flesh, it's what I really need to do for your sake. You know, people, people pass away on a regular basis, right? And members of churches pass away on a regular basis, right? It's a different situation when the pastor passes away. Yes? A little bit? As long as, as, long as he ain't my kid, folks, it's all right for him to get out of here. He said he gained with the Lord anyway. He said he's bold enough to stand for the Lord. So let him go. But you do agree that when the pastor passed away, that's a different type of situation. You know that, right? Talk to me. Why is that different? Because the sheep have lost their shepherd. The sheep have lost their shepherd. What does that mean in layman terms? Sheep will be confused. Anybody else? The leader is missing. Anybody else? Y'all praying for me, right? What's your prayer like? Lord, I couldn't take him out. Couldn't run his blood pressure up. Lord, it's on you now. Y'all will imagine how some folk pray. <laughs> so, so he says, it'll be better for you, it's more helpful and needful for you if I remain here. Verse 25. In being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress in joy and faith. Joy of faith. So he's saying that he's a benefit to the body of Christ. The pastor ought to be a benefit to the body of Christ. People ought to get joy out of knowing their pastor. 
People ought to get joy out of knowing that the preacher is progressing. Because as the preacher progresses, the people ought to progress. I've said to you several times, I want every single person in this church to tithe off of their gross income. Because I know what's best for you. Somebody said, how do you know what's best for me? I know what's best for myself. Because I know what's best. Because the word confirms what I have to say. The next thing I said is that I want everybody in this church to be debt free. That means you can't buy everything that everybody else buys. We like to walk in the door, cash or credit, charge it. We like for the people behind us to say, charge it. Until the lady behind the counter say, decline. Now you want to argue with the lady. Run it again. No, run it again. You, you must ain't doing something right. If I was a cashier, I said, sir, I did the same thing to this card that I did to the card that just left here. Charge it. So I want everybody to tie off their gross income. I want everybody to be debt free. I want everybody to be healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I want everybody to be safe. That's why we want safety here. That's why, that's why we don't want men to leave women and children at the church. We want safety. And if a joker can run over a man, <laughs> the women sure can't stop him anyway. So that's why we want two men here at all times. So we want everybody safe. We want everybody stable. We are praying for you. And in our prayer time, if you have medication, keep taking your medication. We want everybody to be stable, to be healthy, to be strengthened. And most of all, we want everybody to be strengthened in the Lord. We want you to progress in the joy of your faith. Verse 26. And your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul talking that faith talk. Even though I'm locked up, I believe I'm coming out. Even though I, I know I'm going to get killed sooner or later, I believe that I'm coming to you again. We ought to walk by faith and see what God does. Well, pastor, that may not work. Well, that may work. Well, pastor, they may not agree. Well, they may agree. Well, pastor, that's never been done before. I said, Jesus never walked on water before, but he did. Well, pastor, we can't grow the church. No, we can't, but you sit now. You have to walk by faith, talk faith, and live by faith and demonstrate faith. The Bible teaches that he that that which is done without faith is sin. That which is done where there is no faith involved is sin. I'm teaching tonight by faith. I believe that that what I'm saying through the Holy Spirit is impacting somebody's life. I believe when I finish that somebody's life will be made the better. I believe the word of God will pierce the heart of a soul so much so that we will turn from our evil ways. Old habits, old traditions will be thrown away. I believe. I wouldn't come over here tonight. With, I got here later tonight than I ever have gotten here. I was running because I had to get an assignment in and I, I pushed the button at 6.12. And guess what? I'm usually here between 4.30 and 5. But by faith, I believe that I needed to be here so the word of God would be dispensed. That doesn't mean that I'm a great teacher. That just means the word of God is so powerful. 
The Hebrew writer says the word of God is quick, it's sharper than any, any two-edged sword. It pierces back and forth. The word of God will change us. Preacher back home said, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The same gospel that will make Annie shout will make Susan pout. <laughs> it's, it cuts back and forth. It excites us, but it also disciplines us. The word of God. That's why we teach, is that why y'all teach on, on Sunday? Do you, do you just walk in there and say, well, I got this book that's a Sunday school book. I looked at some things this week, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell these children ain't gonna change. They just, they just gonna always be the same. And I'm just gonna walk in here and I'm gonna lay it out here. Yeah, it's just I'm gonna just lay it out here, and when I lay it out here, whether they accept it or not, that's that's up to them. We ought to teach. <laughs> On Tuesday night, Sister Henry, we, we, we're not just meeting to, to have a girl's night out. We're meeting to hear the word of God so it can impact lives, change people, and we do it by faith. And when we operate by faith, we are looking for a miracle. We're looking for a difference. We're looking for things to be different in our lives. Matter of fact, as we teach and we preach, our lives ought to be made to better. The problem is we got too many people who are teaching that think they're teaching for other people to grow when they ought to be growing also. The other problem is we got too many people who are designating the message for other people when it's really meant for you. It's the word of God. It makes us better. Okay, now I'm ready to hear your notes. I'm ready to hear from you as you've studied over the week and, and you've looked at this entire first three chapters, uh, Philippians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and you got your notes all laid out. Come on, let me hear from you. Anybody? You can start with chapter 1. That's where we are. Any, any, any takers on tonight? Just remember now, if we're too busy to read the word and study the word, we're too busy. Who wants to give us something? You covered it all. Jesus. I agree. <laughs> okay, Sister so, so Whitlock, give me some of your notes. What you have? Give me, give me, tell me something you got. And then Sister Davis next, since y'all the spokespersons for the family. <laughs> we're not the spokespersons. You talking about chapter one? Chapter one. Tell me what's we in chapter about one. chapter one already. Repeat what I, don't repeat what I said, but repeat Paul what Paul said. Paul was rejoicing because the gospel had been being spread, no matter if the person was genuine or non-genuine, it was being spread. He was thankful. He was happy. He was rejoicing. And that's what we talked about last week. Okay. Anybody else? I said that this week. <laughs> he was torn between living and dying. He was torn between living and dying. He was saying that uh, if he died, that's gain, so we know he can go be with the Lord, but if he lived, that's better for the people. So okay. we believe that the Lord was going to deliver him because we know the people need him there. That's what I got from that part. Sister Woods, what she's saying, Sister Woods, is if I live, it's better for you. <clears throat> if I die, it's better for me. Now, Sister Woods, which one you want? She wants what's better for her. Amen. Well, I think it is about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. What about it? And what Paul was saying, even in this situation, his whole purpose was is is for the for, for the betterment for the kingdom of God. That was his whole glory in, in doing what he's done. Okay, the whole purpose is for the glory of God. Not him. We, why do we say, why do we say, uh, Lord, why me? Lord, why I'm going through this? Lord, how I, why I got to put up with this? Because we don't understand it is for the betterment of ourselves. Because it's for his glory. Because it's for his glory. He's doing Everything's for his glory? Yes. That's he's what he's doing saying. some things and he's using you. He's doing some things and the good thing about it, he has chosen you. Right. For his glory. You don't know why. Look at God. <laughs> you don't know why he chose you. 
But he messed around and chose you. You got something to say? No, I'm just agreeing with what she said. For his glory. So you're still trying to figure out why he chose you. <laughs> but we agree that it's for his glory. I just wish sometimes he skipped me on that one. <laughs> he skipped you on that one. Sometimes I just wish he would have skipped me. You wish he had to skip you through this, this turmoil and tribulation. We'll don't we all, though? Yeah. We'll understand it all by and by. We'll understand it all by and by. Any other notes? Chapter 2. Who has chapter 2 for me? This is really, not chapter 2, chapter 1, but this has really helped me. This has really helped you. Yes, it has. I've walked by faith. I'm believing by faith. It's helping a lot of people. Thank God for, for the confirmation of faith. The word goes forth, people's lives are changed. It helps them. Anybody else? Any, anything else on chapter 1? Yes. Uh, I downloaded this because I can't have my Bible at the desk. But there was times it was. Oh, is that how we're supposed to do it? Because you just taught, you just trained, you just learned me something. You just, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it says, uh, if you can't have your Bible at the desk, you, you download it. <laughs> yeah. well, and you read your papers, and it's nothing but Bible. My, my, my. I, I didn't know that for 38 years. I, I could have been reading my Bible all the time. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> In verse 19 where it says, For I know that this shall turn my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Christ. And then as I look on down uh, in, the, uh, in the explanation that they gave, uh, salvation here means it's not spiritual, it's physical. Right, so so you're reading King, you, you, you're reading King, yes. English Standard Version. Uh, New King James. New King James. Okay, so deliverance. This salvation is deliverance, okay? And so what, what she's saying is he knows that whatever he's going through is going to turn out for his deliverance. Turn out, this word salvation means your deliverance. I mean, I'm coming through. I'm going through. The good thing about going through stuff, you're going through. What does going through mean? You're going to have a, you're going, this stuff's going to end. I'm passing through. Anybody else? Chapter 1, chapter 2. Who, who got chapter 2 for me? In number 14 it says, do all things without complaining and dispute. Which chapter 2, 14, right? Yeah, Philippians means, chapter 2, verse 14. That you may become blameless, that's chapter 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of, of a crooked and perverse generation. Can you stop right there for me? Let me talk about that. He said, he said, don't do things through complaining. Do things without complaining, without griping, without disputing. And in doing so, you will become blameless. In doing so, it will change you. You know, it's bad when it's always you complaining. Complain about the food, complain about, about the floor, complain about the seats, complain about the music, complain about the teachers, complain about the preacher. There are some people, when you hear something, you know who said it. Thank God I don't have any members at the New Beginning Church like that. No complaining. Hallelujah. Y'all thank God for that. Oh, let's thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. No complainers. Sister Henry said we don't, she doesn't participate in exchanging other folk business, so we don't have any of that. Somebody else said that they don't they don't mind other folk business. We don't have that. I don't. I don't. I'm walking in faith. <laughs> I I'm, I I'm walking by faith, right? By so so the deal is we need to understand that we need to do things without complaining. Who has chapter three? Who has a nugget out of chapter three? Yeah, finish that little bit on chapter two then. Okay, he said, Among you shine as a light in the world. That's what that's what this rap. In you in this dark society, perverse generation, he said, You will shine. Amen. He said, you will be a beacon of light in a dark place. In other words, you can shine in the darkness. You know what? You know something? The light is is at its brightest when it's at its darkest. You believe that? There are lights that are shining in this room that you won't pay any attention to until the lights go out. There are two lights in this room that never go out. 
You can turn every switch in this room off, but there are two lights that will never go out. And you will never notice those lights until you turn the switch off. When it gets dark, you as a Christian ought to shine the brightest. Hurricane hit, flood water was coming up, and uh, the man was trying to tell his wife, we don't need to go anywhere. First thing she said, well, Pastor, what you going to do? I'm going to wait on the Lord. She said, well, we're going to wait on the Lord. When, when you're at your darkest, when you're at the worst state of your life, that's when you ought to shine the brightest for watching you. Chapter 3. Give me another guy chapter 3. Somebody that hadn't talked all night. Somebody that grunted, but they didn't really talk. Chapter 3. Somebody that thought about talking, but they didn't really say much. Chapter 3. I got writing all in my Bible. Chapter 3 and 4. Woo-wee. I know you found something there. Anybody? Everybody waiting to get to chapter 4, verse 13, huh? Is that what y'all waiting on? Chapter 4, verse 13? What does chapter 4, verse 13 say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Y'all do realize what that's talking about, right? Remember, he started in chapter 1 talking about how nice and how kind they were to the preacher. In chapter 4, verse 13, he's still talking about them being nice and kind to the preacher. And he says, and if you choose not to be nice and kind to the preacher, that's all right. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. So you thought that he was talking about you personally and how you can do this and how you can make these things happen. He really is talking about if the church stopped giving to the preacher, the preachers can still make it without them giving it to him. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Look at how you're looking. Look at how you're looking. Amen? Because he's still depending on Christ, not people. He's still depending on Christ and not preachers. God delivered me from preachers that depend on people and not depend on Christ. God delivered me from preachers who depend on money and not depend on Christ. If we depend on Christ, God can lead us in the midst of the darkness into the light. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, for this book, this text. We thank you for these words. We ask you to bless us, Father, that we will carry your word forth and that men, women, boys, and girls' life will be changed. In Jesus' name, we pray that you keep the glory. All God and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me thank those who joined us by live broadcast. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. We appreciate you being a part of our ministry. If you ever want to give to this ministry, you can do so by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls, NBC S O U L S. Thank you so much. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.